I was 14 the first time I said to anybody that I thought I might have a call to parish ministry. When I was 15, I called the local Lutheran pastor and I asked to be baptized. I became aware of that calling when I was seven years old. In my early 30s, um, at a Easter vigil. And then we ended up talking for one hour every week. He baptized me and confirmed me, and um, now I am in seminary. That sense of rebirth gave me the courage to start looking much more intentionally at what God was actually calling me to do. I knew that I was gay from the time that I was pretty, pretty young. I decided that if I wanted to be a preacher of the good news and of the truth that is Jesus Christ, I could not keep living in a lie to myself. By the time I was 18, uh, 19 maybe, uh, I came out and immediately thought, well, so ministry is not an option anymore. Makes no difference race, nationality, denomination, sexuality, period. We are, each of us, a loved child of God. Uh, I first heard about the extraordinary uh, candidacy and extraordinary ordination um, processes and, and community uh, when I was in seminary, and, and it was uh, through my mom. As I was getting frustrated with the denomination's policies about gay people, she was like, well, you know, there are these pastors, you know, that are, that are being ordained extraordinarily, and, and those people were uh, totally signs of hope to me. You know, a lot has changed, but it's still a struggle to find congregations that are willing to uh, bring in an openly LGBTQ intern or who are willing to have a, a student come for their supervised ministry setting. Uh, and it's, it, you know, it's still a challenge to find congregations who are ready to call a publicly identified gay and lesbian, bisexual, transgender uh, clergy to serve as their pastor. Even though the policy of the church has changed, you don't change attitudes quickly. That just does not happen. There's wariness that, that you might, the congregation might not accept you. Um, there are people in the congregation who might be uncomfortable. It's pretty easy to, to despair. At times, it's, it's a, I'm very tempted to just go home. The mission of Extraordinary Lutheran Ministries is really twofold. It's a way and a witness. So essentially, we're providing a way to ministry for LGBTQ people who are called to serve as rostered leaders in the Lutheran Church. And then in turn, these leaders are providing a witness to the full church of the rich diversity of people called to serve as pastors and the rich diversity of God's kingdom. I went to my first ELM retreat. It was like, it was like walking into a place where everyone already knew you and your story. And it was like the one time you didn't have to explain anything. I went into it not really expecting for there to be work in it. I just wanted to be part of a community that understood my experience. They were offering support and, and prayers and newsletters and events happening all over the ELCA, all across the United States of America. So I decided to join. There are lots of struggles and if you know someone who's been through it or if you are just, are just willing to walk with that person in their struggles, that means the world. When the policies changed, what really changed was all of a sudden there was a flood of people, you know, who had also had that sense that they were called to ministry, but who didn't see that there was any place for them in the church. And so they had found some other path. Uh, and they, they started showing up at the seminaries. ELM and Proclaim both serve a really, really important role in helping to find calls for pastors. There are a number of uh, excellent candidates that are called and, and feel very strongly that they would like to serve the church. And they've been accepted by the church, but it's difficult to find a place for them. Um, so I think there needs to still be a lot of uh, education, a lot of uh, communication to help congregations 
get over their fears because there really isn't anything to be afraid of. Even though the policy changed and the doors have been opened to LGBTQ people to serve in this church, there is still so much need to provide the actual concrete resources to make that happen. And it is the individuals and congregations that are providing this financial support that is making this happen. Like the congregation that you worship in or like the congregation that I pastor, uh, our work doesn't get done if people aren't moved uh, to see the future as it could be and not uh, the present as it is and to support that with their time um, and with their story and, and with their checkbook. What is going to happen when I graduate? What is going to happen when I get to assignment? Well, I still don't know what is going to happen. What I do know is that there are going to be a group of people that are going to be praying for me, that there is going to be a group of people that are willing to listen to my concerns, to give their shoulders so I can cry, to tell me that it's okay to be nervous, to accept me as I am and celebrate my gifts and walk with me by faith. And that is amazing, that is amazing.